Turtle Logic in the University of Life, Chapter 3, The Lizard. Hi, snow-capped peaks surrounded us as we walked down towards the valley floor, finally descending from the great mountain that held the three doors. This was familiar territory to the lizard. He knew each and every twist and turn in the path. He had walked this way many times with many others. That was clear to me. A large bald eagle now appeared and glided silently overhead. This eagle was not as massive as the one that delivered me to this world, but it was large just the same, and majestically floated through the sky, moving in and out of the tall pines that filled the steep landscape. The great bird seems to watch us as, we, as it soared above, looking down over the turtle and I as we made our way carefully down the rubble path that led us out of the mountains. It was still quite warm, and the air was calm, with barely a sound to be heard. This journey had shown me many things, many new things so far. It was different than anything I experienced before. I followed close to the turtle, not wanting to get left behind as he continued with his steady walk along the trail to the hollows below. It was getting late in the day, and I was surround. I was wondering where we might stop for the night to rest. It wasn't until then that I felt my first pang of hunger. This will do, the turtle said to me as he paused in an opening in the trees. This will do just fine. So we stopped for the night. The turtle created a makeshift campground out of the items he had stowed in his shell. I was quite impressed. Unlike me, he seemed to be able to pull out whatever he needed on demand. With the twigs and branches cleared away from the forest floor, Alfred and I, Alfred and I sat about to prepare for a comfortable night in the woods. Good thing we made it through the doors. It can get downright nasty over there on the other side at times, Alfred said as he went about busily setting up the various camping gear. The turtle prepared a delicious meal of baked beans and black forest cobbler. He had a great recipe and pre prepared it to perfection. After, Alfred read a bit quietly to himself and then disappeared unceremoniously under a large outcropping of rocks that stood in the darkness just beyond the campsite. I bedded down by the fire in the Sierra Trade Wind sleeping bag the turtle had handed me with pride earlier that evening. I quickly fell into a peaceful sleep that night. A cool breeze flowed up from the valley, and millions of stars covered the clear sky. Warm and cozy was I, out there in the wilderness of my life, with my thick sleeping bag wrapped tight around me. Daybreak came quickly and I rose to the smell of bacon cooking on the grill. Alfred was turning the sizzling strips with pride as he prepared for the day. Sitting there beside Alfred at the wooden table was Bill Kaywood, the old gray fox. He was back again, smoking his cigarette and staring out across the landscape. I walked over and offered a good morning. It was well accepted by the turtle, while the fox softly mumbled something unrecognizable through his sharp yellow teeth. The map of relationship laid spread out across the tabletop, Alfred was enthusiastically running his finger over the parched paper, noting various points of interest and discussing them with the fox, who sat to one side, not paying much attention and only responding in brief, short grunts. So, where do we go from here? I asked the two of them. Oh, we will see, we will see, my friend, the turtle said as he held out a strip of bacon and handed it to me across the table. Get ready, though. We will be going right away. We have lots to take in and many miles to cover today. Gather your things, Alfred, then folded up the map and tucked it away. Bill Kaywood jumped onto the ground and quickly walked away into the tall, thick grass trees that surrounded us. This way, the turtle said to me as he pointed in the opposite direction of where the fox was headed. Bill Kaywood soon disappeared out of sight, back into his own path, I assumed. We packed up the camping gear with little effort. It was all just folded up and was out of sight in what seemed like just a few minutes, and we proceeded quite quickly away. There were places to go, I guess, and the turtle was wasting little time in getting there. The fox was gone. He disappeared back into the forest darkness and shadows from which he had come. The sun rose into a clear blue morning sky, shining down on us like a guiding light that pointed the way. The turtle walked on, as determined as he always was, at a good pace ahead. Above, high in the sky, was the eagle from the day before. He just floated there in the high clouds gliding round and round above our heads, as if waiting, watching. For what I did not know. So Alfred, I said as we walked on, what's next? There was a change in the air at that moment. I could feel it. The path was narrowing. The sky had darkened just a bit. And a cool breeze flowed across my face. Something was up. Next, from somewhere inside the bushes and brush came a loud crunch. A branch that broke. Twigs moving vigorously under the pressure of a strong and powerful foot, perhaps. 
I could almost feel the weight of a thump running toward me in the hidden brush, limbs flying to the side. I was scared. I quickly looked up to the turtle for help, but he was not concerned with either the noise or me. He just looked at me and continued to smile. Then, out of the corner of the, my, my eye, I saw it. A figure bursting out of the brush. It leaped up and landed right in front of me, and I stopped. What is that? I screamed to the turtle. So you would like to know what that is, would you? Yes, please, Alfred, what is this? I said. This, he replied in a calm and reassuring voice, is your lizard. My lizard, I retorted. I don't have a lizard. Well, the lizard looked at me and said, it looks like, it looks to me uh, that you do, and it's standing right there. So I looked at this lizard. He was actually quite small, stood just about a foot tall and walked on his hind legs, just like Alfred and the fox did. Very unusual, I thought, how these creatures all walk on their hind legs. But then again, this was not a normal world. Many things were unusual here. So I looked at the lizard. He was actually quite small. In any case, this lizard, my lizard apparently, was standing there at attention, looking around anxiously with glistening green eyes, not blinking. He was clearly agitated a bit, keeping a watchful eye on everything around me and everything around him. The lizard lined up right in front of me, attentively watching the woods where we stood, looking to and fro, and then straight ahead down the path like a soldier on guard. Its green scaly skin shined in the morning sun, much like the uniform of a sentry on watch. Proud it appeared to me to be in charge and prepared for whatever was to come its way. Then, as if on cue, the little green reptile hopped on my arm and ran up my sleeve. It stood there on my shoulder for a moment. Once again did a brief, brief but thorough patrol of the area and then disappeared into my neck. The little lizard just melded right into the base of my neck. It felt really weird, but I didn't panic after all. The Imago people did the same thing. I thought it quite normal at this point to have little creatures run up my sleeve and disappeared inside of me. I just looked over at Alfred and said in a surprisingly calm voice, Alfred, what's going on? He looked at me and said, come here, sit down on this rock over here. We need to go over a few things. And so I did. Now that we have discovered the biological dream and the map of relationship, we need to move on to some of the overriding factors that make you, as a human, do the things you, you, you do. It is time for you to meet your little friend, the lizard. So let's take a moment and really get to understand him. You see, this little lizard is very powerful, and he's going to be with you for the rest of your life. So it makes sense to really get to understand what this little creature is all about. You see, he is the most powerful creature you will ever know, and he can and will control you with amazing strength. You will be well advised to get to know him and leave and learn to give him what he needs. So, what does a lizard need most of all? He needs safety. The turtle then paused and looked right and looked me right in the eye. An intense expression took over one side of his green face, and he lifted his right stubby arm and placed it on my left shoulder. Safety, the turtle said is the number one issue in, of relationships. It is the most primitive and first condition of connection, con connection you humans have with others. Safety is an easily understood concept, though. People typically say they are safe when their actions so they are quite unsafe. Thus, it is quite important for people to get a common understanding of what safety is and how it works. Think about it, the turtle said. Think how your human culture uses threat as an everyday tool to get what it determines is good behavior. Many couples during their romantic period withdraw from the mainstream of your culture and isolate themselves in order to start building a safe world for just the two of them. And yet every couple I've seen that sits here on these same rocks we are on right now continues to do the same mistake. They use threat in an effort to get love. What I do as a turtle involved in the different couples I meet along this path is try to help them. I help people define safety, understand safety and its process. I help them to develop strategies to remove threat and to build, ensure, and recover safety. This is an important step towards the realization of the biological dream. So I help them with that, and I will help you too. You see, Alfred continued as he brushed some debris kicked up by the lizard off his shell, safety starts with the way the human brain is built. When I was a student of human brain psychology, I was first introduced to the tripod human brain. The idea was that there were three distinct major subsystems in the human brain. Now this might start to get a little technical, but bear with me. 
At the base of the human brain, in the bottom of your skull, starting in the upper neck and including the spinal cord, is a group of structures called the hind brain. Sitting on top of that is a curved group of structures called the midbrain, or sometimes called the limbic system. And then, capping the whole is a large forebrain called the cortex. The names given these three brain sections come from comparative anatomy and seems to reflect human evolution. The lower structures in common to all spinal corded animals, even turtles. In fact, reptiles have this section alone. This is what I mean when I say the reptilian brain. All mammals have this reptilian brain, plus the curved addition of the mammal's brain. You humans have a reptilian brain plus a mammalian brain plus the new addition of the so-called primate brain. As a turtle, I do not as a turtle, I do not like the word brain for all these pieces, as I feel it implies that they can act independently, which they can't. I like to think of the reptilian brain as the basic system, to which is added the mammal addition in mammals, and finally the primate addition in the higher animals. Thus, the functionality of each piece is added on to that of the lower sections. This understanding of three additions helps us understand human behavior much better. You are the most complex of all because you have the most structure. To understand safety, the turtle continued, I have found it useful to grasp a few concepts about each section of the brain. Remember, the cortex is what makes humans able to do what other mammals cannot. You see, the human brain forgets nothing. Though you may misplace it for a while, the primate brain, or cortex, is like a giant computer hard drive. It is all about data storage. The vast majority of whatever happened to you in your human life is stored in your cortex. What happened to you yesterday, what you determined, um, uh, uh, what you dreamed of last night, um, what went on during final exams in high school, it's all in there. This is your memory. It is vast. Memories are stored there even if you can't recall or remember or retrieve them at any moment. Also stored are memories of events from the very distant past. If you opened your eyes at the time when you were born, what happened in the delivery room is all there, including the color of the walls. There appears to be memories from the womb stored there as well. It's all a lot of stuff. Everything is remembered, and there is no real mechanism for forgetting. You see, your human memories are dated or aged, as I like to call it. Every night, your primate brain sleeps. This is very critical to understand. During the early part of your sleep, the indexes to memories are rewritten. It is kind of like a librarian rebuilding the card indexes to the book files each night. By the way, if humans don't sleep, things get weird fast. Within just a couple of days without sleep, hallucinations, where you can't tell the difference between the outside world and the inner world, inner world will start. When you're in a hospital, one thing the staff is very interested in is your sleep. They know that they are giving you drugs that may interfere with sleep, and they don't want you hallucinating while they are responsible. Memories are coded with a sense of when they happen, with a kind of how long ago did this happen. One of the re-indexing operations is the changing of these dates. After one sleeps, today's memories become yesterday's. Each day, the distance of the memory from now becomes greater. This mechanism allows you to put memories in the past, to get some distance from the events. This is part of the system that helps humans recover from trauma, scary events. Those humans who work with people who experience a severe trauma want people to sleep in order to get a distance from their fears. And Alfred went on. Trauma memory is also carried on from your childhood. A baby is born with the primate brain incompletely developed. Apparently, the reptilian brain is fully functional sometime before birth, and the mammalian brain comes online within uh, months of birth. But the cortex is still developing for years and becomes complete, complete in humans around age 12. The last capacity is the ability for abstract thinking. This skill has a significant effect on safety. A human needs abstract thinking in order to deal with memories of terror and to grasp that a memory or thought is not the same as the real event. An example of this is the difference between how an 8-year-old human and 14-year-old human handle horror movies. The younger kid likely will be somewhat frozen by the movie. The events are real to him. No amount of telling him it's just a movie will work. His brain is not ready for that concept. Now, the older kid may enjoy the movie and tell you all about it. I've learned that the difference between the younger kid and the older kid is that the older one can hold ugly facts in their awareness, while the younger cannot handle this material without turning away. 
What happens to the younger kid's memories? The design of the developing primate brain handles this. The horror memory is shunned into a section of memory called trauma memory. This is a place where ugly memories are stored, but do not need to be consciously remembered until the cortex completes its ability for abstract thinking. I witnessed an event some time ago on the on this very path. An eight-year-old was in the forest with um, with his family. It was a great time, uh, and they were all having a, a great time, and suddenly a bear ran out of the woods at the eight-year-old. Adults were present, some dogs too, and they all scared the bear off. When asked later about the incident, the boy said, What bear? He didn't remember the incident just an hour later. He'd forgotten already. See what I mean about the cortex? It's amazing. Now, let's move on to the limbic system. Now, there are several interesting characteristics that relate to the human human's midbrain. Remember, these functions are things that humans all do and that reptiles do not. Let's take joy and grief, the turtle said. Look at the limbic system. Here we find the location of the human functions called the emotions of joy and grief. Since the lower brain, the reptilian brain, controls the emotions of fear and anger, mammals have the entire full set of emotions. This might be part of the reason that children like cats and dogs so much. As mammals, cats and dogs are fully emotional like us, but don't have the cortex capacity for lying or being sneaky. One of the most interesting functions of the mammalian brain is the need for a re reliable community. Here is that need for living in herds, in packs, in villages. Horses are trained easily. They even train themselves by threatening dismissal for bad behavior. Mammals need membership like they need air. Going further, we can say that humans, hermits, are not born, they are taught. Humans as well as mammals are designed to live in a community. The need for togetherness. The um, avoidance of loneliness is hardwired. A hermit is a per person who needs closeness, but whose experience, experiences of closeness have been so bad that they prefer loneliness to what they remember about closeness. Now, let's look at the reptilian brain, the brain stem. Alfred's eye, eyes began to light up. This re reptilian, reptilian brain is one that I can relate to, and it's very fascinating. You see, while the upper brain sections are fascinating, it is the lower brain that is the seat of all the energy of safety. The following functions are common to all humans, mammals, and reptiles. These I call automatic functions. You see, the reptilian brain provides all the automatic functions you need to stay alive, like breathing, digestion, heart rate, that kind of stuff. This part of the brain is so reliable that we enjoy sleep. Who keeps us going while we sleep? It is our reptilian brain, or as I like to refer to it, our lizard brain that does this remarkable job. And it does this perfectly 24 hours a day. It never sleeps. I like to think that the good Lord came upon a design of the brain about 500 million years ago and found it so good that it, he didn't or she didn't change it at all since. All of us, that means all you humans and all us turtles, have pretty much the same design of reptilian brain. The functions are pretty simple, but elegant. And of all things, they are reliable. Here's something all of us can really trust. And boy, Alfred continued, do we ever trust it. This is the part of your brain that takes care of you when you're asleep. Do you sleep? Do you like to just take a break after a strenuous period and just let it all go? For a moment, think how delicious sleep can be. Then think about who is keeping you alive during your nap. Who is keeping you from smothering yourself by accident? That incredibly reliable yet simple reptilian part of your brain. That's who. It is fully in charge, simple, an IQ of one, but what a one. Now, about survival. The functions of this lower brain are all about survival. It makes sense that this important function would be in the reptilian part of the brain. Without it, early evolutionary creatures, dinosaurs, and even turtles like me would have died out long ago. Evolution wouldn't have had the time to create apes, and even you humans wouldn't have come to exist. This elegant device that resides in all of us manages not only our survival, but also the entire issue of safety that is so critical to couples living together. If you are not comfortable with the theory of evolution, let me just point out that God decided to put this function of survival in all creatures, lizards, mammals, and primates. To accomplish this, he placed it in the simplest, common part of all our brains, ingenious to say the least. 
Here's how the survival function works. About 50 times a second, this part of the brain asks the question, am I safe? If the answer is less, is yes, we experience a set of actions related to safety. If the answer is no, then this reptilian part of the brain takes over in milliseconds and we operate in an emergency mode. This is what I call the panic or no safe mode. I recall a phrase I once heard, the triumph of reaction over reflection. Well, it is this survival function in the base of our brains that is the source of all reactivity. It is simple. We react automatically. And when it comes to life and death issues, well, understand that this part of the brain is not designed to be subtle. It seems to think only of life and death. When it is relaxed, there is no sign of death coming from its point of view. Fear to this part of the brain is something like the idea of Godzilla is out there. A little fear, anxiousness, means Godzilla is far off but wandering around. Panic comes across as Godzilla is standing right behind and trying to grab you. This part of the brain is either in safe mode or panic mode, but never both. Getting to know the reptilian brain is to make friends with a co-resident being. It has a mind of its own, and it's very powerful. It cannot be controlled. It sees things following a fairly simple set of rules, and getting to know this lizard can be the source of much joy and much relief. Getting to know it can make sense of so many of your behaviors and reactions. It makes everything start to make sense. So, first, let's get to know him. My wife, and yes, there is a Mrs. Turtle, maintains that all lizards are male, so we will stay with that. You will know him by his activity. As I have said before, he has two gears, that of safe and that of unsafe. Now let's take unsafe first. When your lizard brain believes it is going to die, it kicks into one of four behaviors that can easily see you, uh, that you can easily see in others. These behaviors are flee, freeze, submit, and fight. As the behaviors are described here, look at your own actions and those people, uh, those of the people around you. Learn to recognize a reactive, panicky lizard at a glance. Fleeing is a visible behavior that removes a person from the situation. Reptiles scramble away across the rocks, birds dart off, bunnies hop off. The only survival skill for horses is running away. But humans with their cortex full of learned, optional behaviors are vastly more complex. When your reptilian brain says flee, the cortex comes up with 1,001 ways to get away. So what do humans do? Well, they get in their car and they drive off. They go to the garage, they stay at work, they hide behind the newspaper, they golf, they sit at the computer, they change the subject, all sorts of stuff. A subtle example sh uh, shows when a human drives a car. I've seen a lot of humans do this. While driving home from work and driving to work, sometimes humans drive home slowly, minimizing your time at home, for home is not safe. Sometimes... I see them driving to work slowly and drive home quickly when home was safer than work. A tricky one showed up in a couple I saw in the past some time ago. They used to fight late at night. In the middle of the argument, one of them would suddenly go to sleep, sometimes in mid-sentence. After I thought about the lizard, it became clear to this couple that this was a form of fleeing behavior. The sleeper had run away. Remember, the lizard is thinking for itself and is judging the situation to be a life and death condition. It initiates each of these behaviors. It doesn't help to blame the person who is fleeing. Their fleeing makes sense to their lizard. I also teach to never go after or pursue a person who is fleeing. After all, their lizard already is running from imagined death. This is why stalking doesn't work. No, when someone pulls away from you in panic, give them assist. Help them get away. They will come back all the quicker. In my case with my turtle castle, I remind myself of this all the time. You see, it was typical of me to pursue Mrs. Turtle, so I put up a sign in my castle that read, You will never get love by chasing a lizard. The sign helped me. Free freezing is the behavior of the deer in the headlights of, of a car. Freezing is becoming motionless and visible. There is a principle among lizards and mammals that if I am not moving, I am not seen, I am not there. Think of what reptiles do most of the time at the reptile house in the zoo. They do nothing. Actually, they are becoming invisible for the sake of survival. Becoming motionless involves decreasing all bodily activities, such as breathing. When our lizard tells us to freeze, our cortex rushes through the 1,001 ways to become invisible and tries one. My experience with freezing goes this way. When I see people out here on the path, I pay attention to how they are breathing. Sometimes their breathing just stops. 
I might sense that, sense that their lizard has become panicky for some reason. I may not know why, but they go silent. I tend to look around and what they or I was saying at the moment before the breathing stopped for a source of that fear. When I tell people about safety, I usually ask for a volunteer to come up and to be in front of people. I tell them they will stand up on the rock and do something safe, but a bit silly. Then I wait for the volunteer to come forward. While I wait, I count the number of people sitting dead silent, usually the whole group. Then I say, well, now I have 24 people freezing. Freezing is the behavior of kids in a classroom when a teacher asks a particularly difficult question. No one moves because no one wants to call attention to themselves. A very common form of freezing among males is practical joking. A practical joke is a piece of cruelty done in, to another person. I've come to see practical jokes as a kind of sadism. Cruelty done for pleasure. But what makes this cruelty freezing is the comment. Can't you take a joke? I was just kidding. By those comments, the cruel one is erasing their meanness. They are becoming invisible. Another extremely common form of freezing is asking questions. Let's say you have been thinking about going out to dinner all day. You have been imagining a particular restaurant and the wonderful way they serve food. When your partner arrives home, do you say, let's go to dinner tonight at so-and-so? No, what you say is, what do you want to do tonight? That question is popped on the other person and all the thinking about dinner is invisible. Now, if your partner is sensitive, they may guess you are up to something. They may start a tricky kind of questioning game. Uh, let's see, McDonald's? Oh no, seeing the slight downcast look on your face? Well, how about a movie? All the time they're trying to figure out what you want. Of course, the, the, the reason people are freezing, hiding their sadism, asking questions, is because from their lizard's point of view, being direct means getting killed. Laying low is just safer, and you can't blame them from their perspective. It is. Lying, particularly the passive kind, is a form of freezing. Active lying is saying that which is not so. Passive lying is not saying what is so. I recall from my clinical studies at the University of Life how some people are so used to lying as a normal form of survival that I had to create a special definition. To leave someone in a state of misunderstanding about something that you believe to be important to them. People lie for one reason only. It is not safe to tell the truth. More fully, they lie because their lizard thinks they will be killed for telling the truth. It doesn't help to blame someone for freezing. Their freezing makes sense to their lizard. The trick is to try to make them feel safe. I also think it foolish to blame a person who lies. If someone is lying to you, consider what you are doing to come across as a source of danger to their survival. Remember, it makes sense for them to tell a lie, sense to their lizard. Another typical way of freezing is responding to a question by saying, I don't know. It is a safe way to retreat. I don't know usually means don't ask again and don't get any closer. I think the general goal is to recognize the panic behavior and work towards safety. And what about submitting? Alfred continues, submitting is the behavior of giving in to another. You've probably seen puppies playfully fighting. At a point, one rolls onto its back and doesn't move. The other stands over the prone one for a bit, becomes bored, and walks off. That rolling over with the legs in the air is submitting in mammals. Now turn, turn real lizards, birds, or alligators over, and they will become paralyzed for a bit. Submitting is a survival mechanism of the old lizard brain. Wolves do not fight uh, other wolves to the death. Each member of the pack is too valuable to to kill, and they don't want to lose even one. So wolves fight to the submit gesture. Grizzly bears fight standing up, crawling at each other. Suddenly one bears its head to the side and bears its throat. Both stop fighting and walk off. In western national parks in your world, the rangers give instructors instructions that if a bear attacks, you should roll into a ball, protecting your stomach and lay low. The bear will think you are submitting and consider you a non-threat almost every time. But there's an additional thing about submitting. Recall the puppies fighting playfully. When the winner walks off, it is often attacked from the rear by the previously prone loser. This is a reminder that submitting is a two-step process. Submit and then revenge or attack later. This second step is not so important among mammals. 
which have little memory. Dogs submit nicely most of the time, but the second step of revenge becomes a major problem in humans with all that memory. Step two is often called resentment, and resentment builds. It is a primary destabilizing force in human relationships. When you see a human submitting, you probably can sense that there is trouble ahead sometime. I would like to illustrate this by an image. Let's say you are assigned as a hunter to kill a grizzly bear that has been causing a lot of trouble, killing cattle, for example, and is now threatening people at a remote campsite area. So you take your gun, 200 calibers, and you go to the camp area. You look around, no bear. So you put your gun up on the camp table, pick up your bucket and go to the stream to fill it with water. Then the bear jumps out at you. So you form a ball, protect your vitals, the bear paws you around a little, maybe scratches you. You lay low. The bear gets bored and walks off. What happens when it is 100 yards away? You get up, get your gun, and blow it away. Now, why did the bear die? It has too little a brain. It saw you submitting and said to itself, Okay, heck, the hunter's submitting, so I'm the winner. Where, where are the berries to eat? And thus the bear dies, all because of a small brain. No cortex. If it had a bigger brain... It might have said something like this. Oh, heck, the hunter's, hunter's submitting. No problem. Oh, wait a second. Hunters have a cortex. They'll revenge me if I walk off. I guess I have to kill this one. This way the bear lives. Bigger brain. In your world in the 1960s, about half of your population woke up to the idea that they had been submitting for years, centuries, millennia. Women began expressing their resentment in powerful ways and painful ways that startled men who have small brains. Men who have been used to women's submissions for centuries now are finding themselves divorced. I believe this process is still spreading across the world in various economic and social groups. Women simply do not see the need to submit anymore. For a while, it was pretty easy for them to take their children, divorce their husbands, and get paid for the whole thing. If you wonder about this resentment thing, go listen in a discussion group at a, any local women's center. In the 1980s in your world, the other half of your population began to show signs of resentment. Men haven't had a good deal in your culture for any more than women. Men's resentment is a bit harder to detect. The major symptoms are men giving up their traditional role as wage earner. Men started dropping out, quitting careers in, in industry and becoming cooks on dude ranches. Men become couch potatoes. Men got depressed. I recall many women who had divorced their husbands and who... who now were surprised when their husbands filed for bankruptcy. The women's, the women's income was cut off. They were shocked. Little brains. Another slight variance between traditional male submission and female submission involves emotions. Women traditionally start serious submission around the age 10 to 12 as the beauty ethic takes them over. This process of submission to looks takes a terrible toll on women. Men traditionally start submitting around age 4 to 6 when they realize that the culture expects them to be tough and prepare for war. Boys, boys are taught to hold back emotions just at the age when they should be learning how to appropriately express those emotions. They are also taught to compete and not to relate to others, just at the age when relationship skills are best learned. And, look, and, and these lessons are typically brought to the growing boy by the socializing parent, his mom. As adults, men are criticized for being unemotional by their wives, who are members of the general gender that told them to not be emotional in the first place. I recall watching the showing of Private uh, Saving Private Ryan. Yeah, we have movie theaters here in this world. Not easy to find out, out here, but in any case, the women in, in the theater were turning away from that long, horrible first scene. Then men were slowly nodding in recognition of the horror they had all their lives been prepared to have to face. I often tell women that if they want to understand men, they might not want to watch that movie. Men are brought up to believe they cannot escape that terror. Often, women think they are entitled to avoid it. This makes for an enormous gender difference. So you see, with all this submission and related resentment flowing around between the human gender genders, there are lots of reasons for people to be angry at each other. There's another group in your culture that submits even more than men and women, and that is children. Childhood is almost one constant process of submission from birth up. It seems human children are to be seen and not heard, 
And then when kids get to be teenagers, the human adults are shocked at their rebellion and rage and resentment. It seems to me that human adults have little brains too. Of course, your culture's solution to this problem is to build more jails, but that won't work. It doesn't help to blame the person who's submitting. Submitting makes sense to their lizard. Find out what makes their lizard brain so threatened. Work to make them feel safe. Then there's outright fighting. Heck, you know what fighting is, so we won't expand on that. But I would like to point out that most fighting is just a behavior of the lizard brain being defensive. I believe that without threat, fighting wouldn't occur. It doesn't help to blame a person who is fighting. Fighting makes sense to their lizard. Now, I have covered the unsafe reaction of the lizard, so how about the other side of this when it feels safe? When your lizard feels, when your lizard sees no indicator of death, it relaxes and permits some very visible behaviors. As I describe these behaviors, look at your own behavior and see if you can witness your own lizard being safe. Also, take a look at how you feel when you observe others doing these things. Now, play is play. Now, play is silly, play is ridiculous, play is non-productive, play is never competitive. Your world plays that game of football. It is competitive and is really an analog for war. Competitive is all about winning and making the other into a loser. Competition is all about fighting and making the other one submit. In children, play is often about learning how to do adult things. In adulthood, they play is about relaxing in groups. One way to know if a person's lizard is act active is to ask them to be playful. If they can't be silly, their reptilian brains are in active mode. In primates and some higher mammals, mating is an extension of play. Mating is usually not about making babies. In humans, the impulse to mate appears before babies are possible. The mating impulse occurs frequently throughout the month with no respect to fertile periods, and the mating impulse continues long after humans can no longer have children. Mating is similar to pay, play as it is silly, ridiculous, fun, non-competitive, and all that. You humans seem to do it in the backyard, in trees, on top of mountains, in bushes, in bathrooms, probably anywhere people can go. Nurturing is the act of invest investing energy in the growth, health, and well-being of another living being or yourself. Nurturing is always f focused on the other, on the nurtured one. N nurturing is one form of love, a decision to invest energy in the well-being of the loved one. I like to talk about the plants in my garden at my castle and how I nurture them. I check them for water, for sunlight, etc., all the things they might need. I never tell them to grow corn if it's not a corn plant. Unfortunately, many human children do not experience nurturing throughout their childhood. The focus of some parents is not so much on the growth, wealth, and well-being of the child, but more on their own needs. Children often know they weren't nurtured. What they often experience is a kind of submitting, freezing, fleeing, in the face of their parents' fighting demands. The sad conclusion here is that much of human childhood is often remarkably unsafe. Now let's take creative work. This is the kind of work you do even if you don't get paid. It's fun, joyful, attractive in its own right. Hobbies, gardening, painting, and volunteer work are examples. Most work is a kind of submitting in the face of the fighting demands of employers. Many people in your world find parts of their jobs are creative work and put up with the submitting in order to get to do the fun stuff. This is work that feels worthwhile. So, now, ask yourself three questions, Alfred said to me. He said, in the last six months, when you have been with your partner, do you think your lizard brain has been not safe? What percent of the time? What percent of the time have you been fleeing, freezing, submitting, or fighting? Or conversely, what percent of the time have you been lizard playing, mating, nurturing, and doing creative stuff? In the last six months, what percent of the time has your partner's lizard brain been unsafe, fleeing, freezing, submitting, and fighting? When you first fell in love, what were the percentages of safe and not safe? Someday, I trust you will be able to share your answers with your partner and begin a discussion of the issue of safety. Can you do that? Well, yes, I responded. Great, Alfred said back. That is the road towards the biological dream. Keep walking it. I looked at the turtle and smiled. The sun was glistening off his yellow and green tinted shell, 
competing for my attention with a strong glare that moved through the filtered trees. I squinted just a bit, straining to capture the warmth. I was straining a bit to keep up with the turtle as well. So much information, I thought to myself. Does he expect me to remember all of this? He returned my glance with a smile. There is much information, but it is only background information. This will all settle in as we go, and you will return all of, retain all of it whether you remember it or not. Remember, the cortex forgets nothing. So we will continue, will we, to learn what we must about the cre creature that lives inside you, the lizard. Yes, Alfred, I said. You need to know that he is your friend. He is the greatest friend you will ever know. And he makes all the big decisions that affect your life. He makes the decisions about who you are and about the kinds of people you will let into your world. Do you understand? Do you understand the power that he has? Do you understand that your entire life is controlled by this creature? He determines what you will do no matter how much you think you are in control. The reality is that you are not and he is. So let's take a look at how he makes his decisions. Those important decisions about your life. They all revolve around either safety or unsafety. Are you ready to find out? Yes, yes, I said. Alfred looked at me with a glazed eye. He was in the he was in the zone. This was his specialty, and he knew the lizards of the world well. And so I bowed he, he and so he bowed his head and began to speak once more. The first thing about the lizard you need to remember is that he is extremely quick to react. Since this part of the brain is over engineered towards survival, it takes less than one-fifth of a second to go from fully relaxed to fully defensive. This is what we call reaction. And once the lizard crosses the line into the reactive state, it takes at least 20 minutes for him to recover back to, to a safer position. This is totally normal, by the way. If you get mad, if you blow your top and are in an unsafe state of mind, I have been talking about, walk away, wait 20 minutes, by then your lizard will realize that there is no real danger and set you at ease. Think of trying to shoot a gopher, go for the top of its hole. If you miss, it will take a long time to come back to the surface again. The quickness is a source of all the jumping to negative conclusions. Apparently those creatures that erred on the negative side are often, as often as the positive, died out long ago. Your lizard is designed to go for the worst condition every time. You may have experienced this when you woke up from a nightmare. You turn on the lights, look around the room for danger and nothing's there. But it takes a long time to calm down. We're built this way. Trust, the sense of safety is slow to build. Doubt or fear is almost instantaneous. Reactivity is what keeps your lizard alive. And the lizard is you. When this happens, your human brain experiences um, a flooding of sensation all over your body. In humans, the chemical transfer is adrenaline which is squirted into your bloodstream and in less than a half second hits the majority of cells in your body. This is the stress reaction that prepares you as a human for fight or flight, or freezing or submitting for that matter. It also shuts down your immune system, reduces the movements of your chest, breathing is interrupted, reduces the blood flow to your skin, you feel cold and you get cold sweat, moves blood to your stomach, you feel sick, the lights um, dilates your eyes and maybe empties your bladder and bowels. It's strong stuff. The chemical takes about 20 minutes at a minimum to be removed from the bloodstream. Thus, it takes a fraction of a second to move to fully emergent emergency reaction or panic mode and about 20 minutes to recover or relax, no matter what. You see, the lizard is designed to protect the rest of the brain. And when in doubt, it reacts and goes on the alert. Interesting, the lizard reacts if the normal functions of other parts of the brain are threatened as well. If the midbrain's need for community is threatened, the lizard reacts in survival mode. While the midbrain is producing the emotion of loneliness, the lizard may initiate panic and fighting behavior to make sure that you are not left alone. If the primate brain's need for diversity or difference is threatened, the lizard may avoid contact, freeze, or flee. If the primate brain is, uh, the autonomous behavior is threatened, the lizard may begin submitting behavior. You see, your brain resists and finds painful many things that your society says are normal. For example, the John Wayne image of the independent loner male is scary to your midbrain. Human brains are designed to live in close community. 
Another example is that society tries to coerce conformity and agreement. While your uh, cortex is completely designed around diversity, again, society teaches obedience while your cortex is designed around independent decision-making. In a way, your lizard's reactions are often rational responses to a crazy society. The lizard's reactions frequently appear antisocial when they are really simply create reactive against particular dysfunctional types of social norms. Frequently, it is hidden fear, the deep lizard dynamic that is buried in your frustrations. Mending or smoothing these profound fears seems to be a successful strategy in resolving interpersonal frustrations for, claiming, for calming the lizard. Remember, we're trying to understand and become a source of safety to our lizard. We're trying to become its friend. You see, the lizard is kind of blind. Put your um, but your lizard is your best friend, so try to understand it. Located in the brain where it is, <clears throat> apparently <clears throat> it cannot see the outside world very clearly. It seems to get glimpses only. That's enough. Basically, it looks up at the hind, at the midbrain, which looks through the, at the cortex, which is processing the images of the outside world. Unfortunately, the lizard cannot tell the difference between reality and a vivid imagination. Your cortex is often called an associational cortex. It looks at the outside world and then associates what it sees with, the, with vast memory resources in order to make sense of what it sees. The lizard looks in on the associational activity. I believe that 5% of experience is outside the body and 95% is found in the activity of your brain trying to make sense of out of all those experiences. This dynamic we will cover in detail later at the university. The thing to understand is the lizard reacts to the associations, the activities of the cortex, and not the reality of the world outside the brain. What do you think a nightmare is? It is a it is full of associational activity, of imagination. During the dreaming, your brain has no reality to go by, yet your lizard believes all those images are real and reacts. When you wake up from a nightmare, you look around to see no danger, but it takes 20 minutes minimum to calm your lizard down. It takes very little for your lizard to imagine that everyone is looking at you when you walk into the room and to react to that imagination. You see, the lizard is in charge. As in dreaming, you can see that waking up does not stop the lizard's reaction. It has its own rules, 20 minutes to settle down. You cannot choose to control it. You can cooperate with it, ally with it, but not control it. If you fight with it too hard, if you say it is safe when your lizard is in survival mode, it will take over. It holds control of your blood flow to the cortex and will cut that back or even off. You will pass out, faint, drop to the floor, and the lizard will be much happier. It got rid of the problem, your thinking. This state is often called a coma. Lizard is happy, cortex is shut down. Also, it is best not to tell anyone that there is nothing to worry about if their lizard is active. There is something to worry about for them, but it may be in their remembered or imagined history. You can see an example of this in a panic attack. These occur when your survival mechanism creates its own nightmare and the feedback situation runs to the limit. Kind of like when a microphone gets too close to a speaker in a public address system. The cortex is thinking thoughts that scare the lizard. The lizard starts to take action, such as shallow, deeper breathing, and the cortex perceives the breathing as threatening. This further scares the lizard. The extreme result of the panic attack is passing out, shutting down the cortex. Panic attacks are a great learning experience. If you master them, you have learned how to give your lizard its proper priority in life. It comes first. Now understand that the lizard has full access to your trauma memory, so you had better learn to cooperate with it because it always wins. All the stuff you don't recall from your childhood is fully available to your lizard. This makes sense. Would it be of interest of your survival for your brain to forget dangerous, traumatic experiences? In a way, the lizard is responsible for trauma memory. On the one hand, the experience you faced as a child was dangerous to your lizard. On the other hand, letting the 
as yet undeveloped cortex look at these memories is dangerous to the lizard. So the lizard, actually part of your brain called the Magdalena, makes the decision and routes memories of the experience into trauma memory. Thus, your lizard will react frequently to stuff you don't know anything about. This trauma memory never goes away, since trauma memory is full of recollections that were painful, and pain for children is wounding to the greater or lesser extent, then trauma memory is full of things that probably need to be addressed as an adult, that need healing. Remember that the lizard has no concept of time. It never forgets the past and relaxes strongly to subjects that need healing. This may seem odd, but apparently the reptilian brain has no concept of time. It lives in the forever now. Anything it perceives appears to be going on is in the now. Thus, when your cortex is recalling an event from the pa distant past, the lizard perceives the event as going on currently and reacts in the same way to historical events as it does to current events. Like I said, the lizard lives in the forever now. It's immediate, direct, and simple. So, what do you do about the lizard? As you can see, your reptilian brain rapidly jumps to conclusions, can't see clearly, reacts to things that your society says are normal, is fully aware of lots of scary memories, some of which you are unaware of, and reacts to long-gone events as actively as it does to current events. Wow, I said to myself, this lizard is a powerful little guy, and I have one inside of me. I certainly wondered what my lizard was thinking, what deep trauma might be locked somewhere in me that it has access to. I had to accept the fact that it was in there, always looking out for me, on watch against the dangers of the world I lived in and lived through. It was odd, the thought that my actions and reactions were continuously funneled through the mind of this tiny lizard. The more I thought about it, though, the more it all made sense. It was my basic protector, a first line of defense that everything filtered through. If I was to stay alive, I'd better have a lizard. As odd as it seemed, I felt assured at the fact that I had this little tiny friend watching out for me. It had been quite a while with the two of us sitting on those rocks. Alfred motioned for us to move on, and I followed. We stood, stressed off the intensity of the conversation, and continued our walk down the path. It was quite the forested jungle out there at that point. We had descended the mountains and were now making our way through a lush thicket filled with trees hanging out over the footpath. We had walked for about an hour, in my time anyway. It felt like an hour. The clouds thickened just a bit. The air cooled. I could feel that another lesson was about to reveal itself. Then, as if on coup, clue, bam, something hit me in the right side of my body. Again, wham, another punch on the left leg just above the knee. From the recessions of the thick forest, one after another came these series of objects shot right at, right at me. I looked at the ground. I, I could see that I'd been hit, that something had hit me. It was a couple of small, round, spiked balls, tiny balls with spiked, protruding fins all over. One was the size of a golf ball, the other was the size of a baseball. Then more came whistling past me through the air. They came in all different colors, tan, black, gray, red, um, and had looked like metal razor blades and silver spikes attached to them. The tiny spikes protruded from their shell like claws on a tiger's paw. I fell back, losing my balance in an attempt and, and to dodge the flying attack. A large group of them flew by me. Some hit and certainly shook me when they did. It was quite frightening, to say the least. They would fly out from nowhere and it hit my side and then vanish. This kept happening at, uh, at, um, at random as I attempted to run for cover. The assault would stop for a minute and then, bam, from nowhere where another bunch would rush at me from the weeds. They would fly through the air and hit me again and again. It was absolutely frightening. I was in a state of confusion and turned in desperation of the turtle for help. What's this? I yelled as the balls kept hitting me over and over again. What is going on here? I yelled again. The turtle paused up ahead and turned to look back to see what all the commotion was about. Oh, those, he responded. Those are triggers. Triggers? What are triggers? What are triggers, you ask? That's a great question. The turtle finally stopped and walking and and turned to look at me. He just stood there, st st stretching his neck out to look through the 
trees and bushes, as if looking for more of the triggers to come. There were no more. It seemed as we were standing in remark there we were standing in remarkable silence. He then slowly looked up at me. Remember the all powerful, undefeatable lizard? As I looked up, there he was, my lizard, standing at attention, like some military guard perched like a stem stern scout on my shoulder. Your lizard, and there he is, the turtle pointed out, is designed to react to any sense of danger it sees. It's reacting right now. The thing is that it will react passionately to small, innocuous events in the same way it reacts to large events. You see, all events, big or small, remind your lizard and access its deep reservoir of long-repeated past events. Those little spiked balls, those are only the triggers. Not very powerful in themselves. They may be annoying, but... They are in themselves not too much to worry about. Your lizard, however, sees them in an entirely different way. It is how your lizard sees them that you will need to be concerned about. Let me explain. The turtle then walked over to me and reached out his hand. Come now. Let me help you back up. As I regained my balance, he went on to explain to me just what those triggers were all about. Probably 95% of a person's emotional reaction is in their history to all that stuff buried deep inside. Only about 5% is to the event that triggered it. What you just experienced back there on the path was the invasion of a bunch of triggers. They represented about 5% of any situation. Remember, you will still have about 95% to deal with. One of the purposes of our journey here is to help you manage that other 95%. And managing your safety does that. That is, it helps you make your lizard become one in the presence of that other 95%. Our goal, remember, is to make that little green lizard feel safe so he will go back inside and continue with his important job of keeping you alive. If he's preoccupied with sitting on your shoulder, he is not inside running other things. We walked on for a while longer. The little spiked balls had stopped flying over the path and my lizard, about 20 minutes later, receded back to where he came. Alfred then continued talking. When you see a trigger, beware. There is usually a powerful energy field lurking nearby. Let me explain it this way. Let's take the feeling of panic brought on by the emotion of loneliness. Your partner being late for a date may trigger this in you. In addition to feeling safe when we are together with other people, we need to feel safe when we are alone as well. And believe me, when I tell you, when we are alone, there can be real panic. The panic... That stems from loneliness, loneliness seems to come from memories linked to your distant past. Frightening memories of the events of your childhood when you may have experienced loneliness at a very young age. This being alone is a source of much anxiety. Remember, as a baby, if you were abandoned or left alone for a very long time, you would die. This is not a make-believe problem. It was and is reality for every infant in the human world. The legacy of this trauma is scary for the midbrain, and the lizard picks this loneliness up and can panic. You can see from this example alone that a major source of unsafety within relationships occurs around this notion of loneliness or being abandoned. In fact, almost all wounds from childhood occurred in a relationship, and that relationship was the one between the child and the caretaker, between your mom and dad and you. And almost all adult reactivity your lizard panic occurs in relationships of one form or another. So, it always comes back to relationships, I said. Yep, the turtle responded as we walked. Intimate relationships provide the greatest possibility for reactivity. Your partner, the one you selected in the process of falling in love, will provide those panic opportunities in abundance. And remember, turtle logic explains that if you pay attention to only the triggers, you miss the point. The triggers, remember, are only 5% of the situation. They are the little things that occur in the outside world that you have little control over. The other 95% of one's reactions are fueled by a lifetime of hidden trauma related to that trigger. This is the energy you need to be aware of. So when you sense your lizard is starting to lose it, try to remember that your lizard has been triggered to access some powerful deep memories and that is using all of them in the here and now to formulate an emotional response in the here and now. So what do you do about the triggers and all that hidden emotional stuff, I said. 
Well, Alfred continued, the easiest thing to do is to somehow increase your lizard's awareness that your partner, the one who is late for the date, is not the person that they remind you of. If you react dramatically when someone does something because it reminds your lizard brain of the 2,000 times that your mom or your mom did the same thing, invite yourself to clearly distinguish between your partner and your mom. You see, in your lizard's eyes, that person is your mom. Then, the next time they do so-and-so, your lizard may pause for a moment and double-check. Is this mom or is this my partner? Those few seconds of pause can grow and grow over time. Well, how do I do this, I asked. It is actually quite uh, easy. The lizard is quite blind, easy to fool, and it loves nurturing. So get your partner to do something that your lizard interprets as nurturing and get them to do it often. The lizard will begin to see your partner as both reminding you of those old threats and also the one who does nurturing things. You have got to confuse the lizard. There are a number of uh, techniques you will you can employ to create this in your life and you will learn them. You'll learn all about them once you get to the University of Life. I will talk about these in detail then. Don't be too concerned about understanding them just now. Just know there are valuable tools, tools to, ma to be mastered, and master them you will. Your long-term goal, the turtle continued, is to get your partner's lizard to push towards you because you are a source of safety to it. Remember that, my friend. The sky cleared, bird noises filled the air, and the sun set low in the afternoon sky. The bald eagle soared above, circling in the high wind that blew over our trail. He had been falling us along, gliding in the high wind circles throughout the, the day as we walked on far below.